sit here. So my name is Rusty Hoffman, uh, Professor Chief of Interventional Radiology. Let me just kind of figure out, you know, first rule of uh, public speaking is never go over your time. Second rule of public speaking is to know your audience. So raise your hand if you're an undergrad. All right. Raise your hand if you're, if you're not an undergrad. Okay. Raise, so master's student? MBA. MD, MBA. Got it. And master's or MBA? Master's. Master's in? Um, environmental science. Got Focus on global health. Cool. Um, and uh, the undergrads, just tell me what your majors are. We'll start with, what's your major? Computer science. I started out as a double biomedical engineer at University of Illinois, and then uh, in my junior year, decided I wanted to go to medical school, so switched to chemobiology so that I could get all my prereqs in to go to medical school. Um, so, uh, how many people know what interventional radiology is? Right, one. Okay, so most people, when I tell them I'm an interventional radiologist, think that I'm a they say, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. You get to fly all around the world and read x-rays. And I'm like, no, I'm not an international radiologist. I'm an interventional radiologist. So I do minimally invasive uh, procedures all day long. They can take me as long as 15 minutes, or the longest I've ever done is 16 hours. So I wear lead, a skirt, and a vest, and thyroid protection, and I use real-time x-rays to watch my tools. Um, I'm like Homero, which is uh, Homero, which is using, you know, light to see what he's doing. I use X-rays. I also use CAT scans. I use ultrasound and MRI. So that's why I live in radiology. So you guys know what a cardiac stent is? So that you know, little you know, metal tube that you put in arteries that was invented by an interventional radiologist. And anybody bonus points to know what was the first animal that was implanted into, and the name of said animal. So, so the was by Julio Palmas, implanted in a dog, and the dog's name was Rusty. So I was destined to become an interventional radiologist. Um, so I'm going to tell you about, I, I actually spent much of my career in medical device de uh, development, design, and running um, stuff all the way from the bench top uh, to phase three clinical trials. Uh, but when I, I like to just solve problems, and so one thing that I hope you guys will take away, especially the engineers in the room, is don't ever create a tool in search of a problem. First, look at the problem, and then figure out what tools you need to solve it. So I'm not a computer scientist, although I did have an Apple II when I was in high school. Um, you, I decided to start a tech company because that was the tool, they had the tools, or, that I needed to solve the problem I wanted to solve. So, um, Grand Rounds right now, uh, how many people have heard of Grand Rounds? And you've all heard my feelings for so one. So, so it's a company of about 320, 330 people. It's in San Francisco, it's our headquarters, and we have two other offices in uh, Reno, Nevada, and Lewis in Maine. Uh, I started the company actually exactly six years ago, um, and we're responsible for taking care of over three and a half million lives. And I'll kind of explain to you how I did this and things that I learned. Again, this is uh, meant to be very informal, um, given the size of the class, just raise your hand and you can interrupt me at any time. And I'll answer one of the questions if, in fact, you're unclear about what I'm talking about. Okay, so we're talking about why I found it, what we do, how we do it, how did I actually start the company, and what I've learned from doing it. 
So why did I start going around? Here's emblematic of why. So this is a 42-year-old guy uh, that had back pain and he got an MRI. And uh, actually this guy was a neuroradiologist based in uh, South Carolina. And the MRI showed that he did not have an IBC. He weighs 265 pounds, he's about 6.2. He's got big legs, and as a kid, he said he couldn't run with the other kids because his legs got tired. Uh, here's, the, here's the CAT scan that basically shows, I mean, because you guys are positioned, there should be, if I can get the corner to come across here for our friends in the Philippines. This, this structure here is the aorta. Right next to it should be another circle that's about 50% larger. What's called the inferior vena cava that is responsible for draining basically all the blood from your diaphragm below up to your heart. This is, is gone and missing. So I do a procedure where this is one of those, this guy took me seven or eight hours. And I get into his veins that look like spaghetti and figure out and put in uh, stents and angioplasty balloons to reconstruct him into nice tubes so that his blood flow can flow well. When I started doing this 15, 17 years ago, there was probably only about three or four people in the world that were doing it. Now we're probably up to doing this type of procedure. 25 maybe, um, but uh, it's, it's something that is transformative for these patients. I uh, just saw a patient in clinic yesterday that I did this procedure for the case in LA. Um, the way this person found me was one of his partners had been in Hawaii at a talk where he heard me do talk about this procedure that I call the full metal jacket, because we were stenting him from his heart down to his femoral heads bilaterally. And if you look at what he says, uh, he basically says, I'm asking him how he was doing, and this is a year afterward. He said the leg swelling was down, done. Gosh, the, the leg swelling, this on the second paragraph, was down with the days. I used to have rock hard tasks with mild pitting edema in my whole leg. I, I thought was muscular and tight. They're small and supple. I've gone down to shoe size and I'm able to exercise for long periods of time and I've lost 60 pounds, nothing short of life changing. So this guy's been living this way for many years and I would be able to help him. Here's what it looked like in the Cascan eight years later showing that the steps are open. Another example is a woman lived in Australia. She told me that she wanted to mortgage her house to come to Stanford so that I could help her. I said, uh, don't do that, just uh, send me your medical records and your imaging and let me see if I can help you so you don't have to mortgage your house. She did that. I looked at it and said, hey, actually, you just need one stent. You don't need the full metal jacket. I'll find you a local doctor in Sydney that is well-trained that can do that. She's 25 years old. She got the stent. Her leg no longer swells. So she's able to go back to a normal lifestyle. Then finally, my, uh, this is my youngest son, Grady. Uh, when he was eight and a half years old, he developed a life-threatening illness called aplastic anemia and needed a bone marrow transplant. It's probably the scariest thing I've ever got, dealt with in my life, so probably it is, in my life. The treatment of choice is a uh, transplant, bone marrow transplant from a sibling. Uh, my two other sons did not match him, uh, but I did. The problem was the doctor at Stanford didn't know if that was the right thing to do versus giving him medication because to have a parental donor is incredibly rare. And the reason we I match him is my wife and I both come from Ireland, so there's not a lot of genetic mixing over the many centuries on an island. Um, so uh, I had to end up calling experts around the country to find out what needed to be done. They recommended the transplant. Grady's done well. And he's a normal, healthy kid. He's got a date Saturday night. He's going to start the working on Sunday. But, you know, the, the problem is, Grady probably would have had a different outcome if his dad did not happen to be professor in chief of interventional radiology. He could call up the NIH and the Hutch. He gets someone to call him back within two hours to discuss their, their sick kid. So, um, 
I've seen this as a physician, I've seen this as a father in terms of patients just searching for help and not knowing how to get the right care. So my idea was, what if we were able to take really the world's experts and give them awesome technology so that they could be available to any person at any place at any time. And so that was really the concept of Grand Rounds. Has, any, has anyone heard the, the term Grand Rounds? So Grand, Grand, Grand Rounds is basically started at Johns Hopkins uh, in the early 1900s where there was a patient they did not know how to treat the patient. They would bring the patient to a big conference room like this and all the doctors would look at the patient and try and figure out what the right treatment is for the patient. That has now morphed over time to where like, I get invited to go to Duke or Vanderbilt or whatever to talk on my research on blood clots or my research on entrepreneurship um, in terms of disseminating the latest and greatest technologies to the bright young people of tomorrow. What we do is we do a couple of things. One is uh, a remote medical opinion, and the other is uh, office visit. And uh, this is all done through a web interface where a patient comes in, uh, either on their phone, you can download the app from the app store, or on, on the website at greenhouse.com, and fill out the information. And basically the way it works is the, the patient fills out information about what's wrong with them, where they've been seen, then the company Grand Rounds scours the country and collects all the medical records. Uh, we index them. We then uh, send them to one of the top 10 or 20 experts in the country so they can be reviewed. Uh, the expert writes up an opinion that goes back to the patient, and uh, the patient then has a, an idea of what's the best course of action. We have you know, the who's who in academic medicine uh, across uh, across the country as part of our panel. We have somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 of those experts that uh, participate in this. We pay them basically a case rate for each case that they do. The experts have awesome software that we built that they can look at x-rays and on the right they can write up their opinions. Um, and it's delivered uh, both electronically and via email uh, to the patient, and it's great because the patient now has a document written about what's wrong with them and what the next steps are that they can share through the portal or via email to all of their loved ones so they don't have to repeat the story time and time again. When a patient comes to see me, they just walk out with a handshake. It's everything is oral tradition in medicine. There's nothing really written down and handed to a patient. So. This is the scary part. So when you look at what we do with our expert opinions, two-thirds of the time, there's a major change in uh, treatment or diagnosis. The two of our uh, three patients is actually getting care that is suboptimal or significantly suboptimal. This has been my experience at Hopkins and Stanford, and if you talk to any physician at the tertiary care center, they do not find this number to be uh, out of whack with their own practice. So overall, the quality of care in America is terrible. Uh, the good news is when you talk to the patients and you educate them and spend the time so they learn about their disease, there's a major change. Uh, there's the patients listed in care. So we have 85% of care is for treatment recommendation. Um, the doctors, the physicians that do, uh, are you guys familiar with the NPS score? How many, who's heard of NPS? So it's a way that you, you monitor uh, patient consumer satisfaction, not the like, 1 through 5 score, the 1 through 10 score. Apple has a score of 60, Tesla is like 50, the Ritz Carlton is 55, your health plan is 2, um, you know, an auto dealership is like 8. Uh, but you can see our experts are at 80 with the software and services that, they, that, that they're using to provide the expert opinion, and our patients are at 60, so on par with Apple, Tesla, and the Ritz Carlton. What we're targeting is the people here in the bottom, uh, bottom part of the, the cost. Really about 10% you know, of people drive 80% of the total cost of the healthcare spend in this country. And so we're trying to intervene on those patients to decrease the cost for uh, the health system overall. We have another product that say you live here in, you know, 
in Palo Alto and you hurt your shoulder, you, your primary care doctor has you know, tried physical therapy, you're not getting better, you need to go see an orthopedic surgeon. Believe it or not, primary care doctors really don't have a good lens into all the subspecialties and who's good and who's not. You want to go see a shoulder surgeon, not a knee, not an ankle, not an elbow. So what we do is we identify you know, particular areas of expertise related to the subspecialties. We make sure that they're high quality physicians, and I can talk about that. It's an algorithm that we've built over four years and scored every practicing physician in this country, and we make sure they're on your insurance panel. So it's somebody that you can actually see. We also take in uh, consideration in terms of language preference, gender preference, as well as distance, so that we don't send you too far away. So if you look at uh, the problem is you know, here is that with our quality score, each circle is an individual practitioner, and the greens are doctors that are good, and reds are doctors that are not. So no matter where you go, there are good doctors and bad doctors. You want to go to the good doctors. You do not have any idea of how to find who is a green dot, unless you're using something like Grand Rounds, using Grand Rounds. This is something that we developed and have pioneered, and, and there's really nobody that does what we do uh, at, at Grand Rounds, and it's a testament to our, our robust data science team. The, um, when we send patients for their office visits, we you know, send them their appointment reminder and a map, and then we also tell patients, hey, guess what? You know, you're going in for your, I can't read this from here. When you go see your doctor today, it's about breast cancer. Like, we've taken care of lots of breast cancer patients, so we know what their questions are going to be, whether it's before or after. For the patient, it's the first time they've ever had breast cancer. But we say, hey, why don't you make sure you ask what's the best course of therapy? Is the lumpectomy as effective as the mastectomy? Do I go take chemo before or after this? Um, what about radiation therapy? Uh, how, what can I do to optimize my condition? What should I expect both short term and long term? As doctors, we do a terrible job, terrible job about telling patients what to expect after surgery or procedure. We also have developed partnerships with uh, really the premier institutions across the country. I was on the phone with MGH yesterday um, in order to facilitate access to these world-class doctors in person as well as to, for them to give the opinions. And our business model is that these are, these are our customers. We go into you know, Comcast and say, hey, you're spending a lot of money on healthcare and your people are getting bad care. Guess what? They're getting bad care two out of every three times they're getting bad care. We have a better way to help you. And by the way, when you do our, use our expert opinion process, you save eight to nine thousand dollars per patient. So that's a pretty convincing argument uh, to these people. Um, Walmart, uh, this is a slide from a year ago. Uh, we have Walmart, we have Home Depot, and we have over a hundred uh, corporate customers. And then here are different institutions that we partner with uh, across the country um, in, in order to, to provide the, the services that we do. So that's what we do real briefly. I'm now going to talk about how I started the company. And what sort of, I was going to tell you how I started and then what I learned. And then I can open it up or I can pause here and take any questions on what I did so far. Yeah, I'll keep on trucking. So, um, I first uh, bounced the idea off of some friends and family. Uh, Eighty to ninety percent of the people I talked to thought it was a bad idea, and there's no way that I could scale it. Um, but uh, a good friend, though, is a venture capitalist. Uh, it's like Rusty's. This is a really good idea. I think we should do something with this. Um, and I did. I knew there was a need. My phone rings off the hook. Ask people asking me for help. When they uh, get sick, I was on the phone last night with my cousin who was in Texas, really, to his boss. They've got something going on. Um, and what's scary now is because this is such a great service, I now get called by doctors working at academic centers across the country to use Grand Rounds for their loved ones. So if there are people that work at really great places and their loved ones get sick, they can't figure out how to do, navigate the system. They need grand rounds to do it for them. 
I was only was only yesterday with a different doctor whose sister I helped with uh, his green rails and help. So I wrote a business plan instead of the MBA in the room. Don't laugh too hard. Um, I just Googled it, like, how do you write a business plan? I didn't want to write, like, a 45, 50 page business plan. So I just wrote the executive summary. Um, and I wrote, and this was, the company was called eSecondOpinions.com. And uh, I talked about the problem, the solution, the market, the team, and the financials. And then I just built a, a spreadsheet showing, like, how you would be able to build and scale the team. Yeah. Oh, so great question. How come I didn't want to be CEO? You'll learn that in my next year. You'll, <laughs> you'll learn your great question, but you'll, you will see. So, I needed to find a CEO. Good question. Um, my fundamental philosophy in medicine and in life has been, if you get an expert involved in whatever it is, your, your outcome is going to be a logarithmic scale better. For example, when I built a house when I was at Hopkins, we had these plans to throw some piece of dirt in and get utilities in and stuff that was on the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, the builder had plans that we could just use when we bought the lot. And my parents were like, must be any of you built like, why don't you get an architect? So like, we got an architect involved, and we got an interior decorator involved, involved. And I can tell you our return in three years on the house was 150% on the return of the house when we sold it because I got recruited here. And that return would have been maybe 30 or 40% if I done with the builder's plan. So the architect was able to just make something completely novel that had not been done in the community and was beautiful and compare with all the space and requirements that we had. Um, I'm a great doctor um, and I'm a good businessman. But I wanted a great business plan to run this company, to build it and scale it. And what's really important, and you'll hear a little bit about, especially as doctors trying to run companies, is when you go to look to raise money, really the number one thing that the venture people are looking at is, what's the team? Are these people, because if you have a great team and a mediocre idea, you actually can be successful. So they really want a, a well-seasoned team, or someone that they believe will be able to execute. Now, with an MBA, you uh, probably have it. I would be worried, like, having a few high prior business experience and stuff like that, whether the, there's a lot you learn by, and I'll tell you about my CEO uh, and, and why he and I got together. Um, I got seed money that was uh, just under a million dollars and started this, like I said, uh, six years ago. Um, basically then con constructed an MVP, minimal viable product, that actually allowed us to have patients input data onto the web. We got the records, we had experts do it. Uh, they just did it on a PDF and wrote it on a Word document and then we brought it and sent it back to the patient. So very just like proof of concept, what's the demand, what type of things do we need to build? And we just test, test, test. So the woman that's interested in product, so the A-B testing, test one way, test the other way, see what the outcome is, what patients like, what they don't like, in order to iterate and iterate and iterate. Um, we, uh, I had done this all by myself. We, the, the guy who gave me the initial million was uh, interim CEO, and then we had everything up and running. We showed that we were getting those major changes two-thirds of the time, and then said so we need to find a real deal CEO. And, and make him a co-founder. So Owen Tripp, who is my co-founder and CEO, he actually was the COO and co-founder of Reputation.com, which is the size of the radio about like, people writing nasty stuff about showing wine they can make it go away. Um, and uh, he'd done that for seven years, so he'd been involved in a startup, he'd been involved in fundraising, and he's just an amazing person. So we um, we got $10 million uh, from Denrock, and we were then able to sign uh, an incredibly large client as, as really our first big client. We scaled the team. We raised $40 million in 14 and $55 million in 15. Um, we have to have a rock or an optic to invest in, in Green Realms. And, um, and the company is doing incredibly well. We're like 320 people now. 
and you have a positive form of septic and the septic growing and growing. Most I would recommend that you read is I didn't realize my whole research career and starting this company, I was doing something that someone wrote in a book, I don't know this came out, 2012 or 2013, called The Lean Startup. It's all about MVP, AD tasking, or engineering. That's what I've done in my research career. Just be down and dirty, do something, see if it works, and then start optimizing it. Um, another great book on, on learning, on being creative, which is actually something you can relatively teach, is this book, Crafting Creativity, I read about 16, 17 years ago. If you want to learn about how to, to raise money and term sheets and the like, it's a great book called Venture Deals. And then a book I read 15 years ago called The Power of Focus. That's something that was very helpful to me um, in trying to be uh, more uh, efficient. What I learned, this is something that just came out of Stanford uh, recently, that uh, why doctors can be good at inventing but bad at innovation. And it shows that um, doctors are great at saying, hey, this is a need, let's we'll try to do something, but you really need a business team. To, to scale it, and, and the skill set that the business team has the Grand Rounds blows me away every day. Like, I can't believe the way they think and approach uh, problems and how they try to solve it, which is, I, I way, way underestimated the skill that was needed uh, to, to, to do what, at a scale of what, what I wanted to be able to do. What I've learned is you really want to hire Hire a great business partner. Remember, you know, have a tool that solves a problem instead of a tool that's in search of a problem. Have a good business plan. Raising money is a game of poker, so you'll reach out of investor deals. And the VC uh, focuses on the team as much as they the idea. You really want to have great venture backers. Like, if you have a list of venture partners, it makes it much easier to uh, recruit talent to your company because people are like, wow, the Greylock invested in it. They must be awesome, like the Greylock invested in Twitter and Facebook and Airbnb. So they were like, this must be the next thing. Focus on what you're trying to do, build over build. And really in the business world, your EQ is so, so much more important than your IQ. So I'm looking at the engineers in the room, and the IQ is probably off the chart. No offense to computer science, but uh, I'll do that probably as well. So then you really got to, when you're in the business world, it's not how smart you are, it's how well you work with others. If you don't work with, uh, well with others, you're screwed. So don't, you know, always ask yourself when you're in a confrontation or in your meeting, do I want to be right or do I want to be successful? As I told you, these business people are as smart as the people I work with here at Stanford. They're very scientific, actually, on how they build things. And I was way, way, way more successful in this than NIH funding. I believe it's more impactful. It actually took me less time to raise all way more money than I've ever gotten from the NIH. Um, and this is what I tell my kids. You know, if you tell someone an idea and they respond, that's a good idea, it's probably a good idea. But if you tell someone your idea and they respond, that's a crazy idea, that's a stupid idea, it's actually probably an amazing idea. You should pursue it. So, those are my slides. Happy to open them up to the, to the class for questions. So. Yeah? I was curious how the history of times went. Did you write on slow moments? Great question. Um, so, at Stanford, you're allowed to spend up to 20% of your time consulting. You have to disclose it in your annual disclosures. Um, so, max is 20. Right now, I'm probably somewhere around, you know, 5 to 10%. Although, my entire career, from when I started uh, in 2000, once I finished all my training, I've always devoted probably about 10% of my time to working with startups, large medical device companies, pharma, um, and biotech. Because I just found it's a place that you can go really fast and um, you can uh, really have a massive impact. Whereas like writing a grant, like you end up, you know, figuring out curing cancer in the mouth, which we've done about eight times, so I'm really, 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 really well. 
my stomach for this anymore. Um, so that's how that's how I've done it. So it's key to get a great cane. That's why I want to get a studio. Sure. This is hard. It seems like it would be a great giveaway with a lot of customers. There's a few levels of people who want to be in the hands. And then you can raise a lot of money. So it's a lot of staying in the highway. Do you get a good year and get all of your hands on the battle? And so, hey, you can do that same thing. Well, so when you raise venture money, they all, you know, the, the, the dynamics of, of a venture fund is interesting. They typically the life of the fund is about 10 years, and then they return capital back to their LPs. And so they typically would like to have an exit at some point. Um, so an exit either someone buys you or you go public. So that's you know that's their hope by investing in you. So that's their goal. Their, their venture capitalist never is. I want to build a company that actually has makes a lot of money, makes money profitably, and then just gives us the profits. They want us an exit. So we're we're continuing to do very well. We've had um, continued success. I would imagine in the next few years will be some type of event like that with a wide but things are going on. Uh, what is my hope? Great question. Um, the benefit of having a um, the benefit of having it as our own company is great, and that it's private is we can build and do things that we think are right, and we're not under the auspices of a being a publicly traded company. Um, if we're a publicly traded company, it's quarterly reports, and that can impact your stock and your shareholders and all that. So, uh, so there's it's great being a private company. That's awesome, but you have to grow up at some point, and so. IPO versus being purchased depend on who, if someone was trying to purchase us, who they were and the partner, what they would want to do with the company and things like that. So I want, you know, I firmly believe that healthcare is so broken that we are the first company that basically put doctors and patients in the center of it, figured out employers are paying for this, and let's build a, let's build a system around this that works as opposed to the dysfunctional system that I work in every day. So I really want to try and continue that legacy going forward, and hopefully it's a company my grandkids still know, would know about. Yes? You said that you still only you spend only like 5 to 10 percent of your time in ground rounds. Um, why, why have you limited it to like 5 to 10 percent? Well, why have you like stayed in Stanford instead of like making that maybe your full-time job? Yeah, so I mean, your grand rounds has been asking me to be the chief medical officer for years. Um, I mean, I'm on the board of directors, and uh, so I participate in those quarterly meetings. And then also uh, certain types of uh, strategy discussions and things, particularly that related to patient care and new products that we want to develop is, is my wheelhouse. Um, it's an incredibly personal decision. I, I really like um, the freedom I have as Stanford to do and pursue anything I want and to solve whatever problems I want to do as opposed to going to work every day and someone telling me what I have to do. Like if literally if tomorrow, like right now, I, my clinical research is blood clots. But, you know, I was at Hopkins, I was doing stem cell research. And before that I was doing gene therapy with virus research. Like I can pick anything and start working on it and enjoy it or not enjoy it and then move on to the next phase. So I really like the academic freedom that I have by working in, in, in an academic center. Yes. So the question, I'm going to repeat it for our, our people. I, Sorry to the people in the Philippines that I wasn't repeating the question. The question is, what's the most popular uh, area in medicine for the exit? For the experts or for the office visits? Mm -hmm. So office visits just by uh, volume is uh, primary care. You know, internal medicine, OBGYN, family practice. Um, on the expert side, our number one disease area is musculoskeletal because we. 
So we work with, you know, self-insured employers. So these are people that are working between the ages of, you know, 18 and 65. So musculoskeletal is number one. Cancer is number two. Uh, neurology is number three. GI is number four. Cardiac is number five. So those are the different. And, and that's, but then we have a long tail. I mean, that's still, those top five, I think, account for about 40%, and then the rest of medicine accounts for the other 60%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So have we encountered any liability issues? So, um, you know, we've never been friends with these we've never been sued, nothing like that. The, the good news is, you know, uh, reading records and writing, it's like the safest way to practice medicine, hands down, safer than what you do and I do every single day. Um, and uh, we, we also, though, you know, as a preponderance of caution, we do have not practice insurance, but it's incredibly cheap because of how we're doing what we do. Um, uh, so we're not covering people with it. Yeah. So, you know. Next, any questions? Yes. Can you just talk a little bit more about how you identify the best experts? Sure. Uh, it's based on height. So, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, the question is how, how do we identify the best performing experts and for the people in the Philippines? Not six foot five. So, um, so the. Uh, So it's based on a a couple things. So if you, are you a practicing physician? I'm a medical student. Medical student, right? What year are you? Oh, awesome. Green. Okay, <laughs> great. Well, welcome to the family. So um, first year medical student. So if you, you know, I get called my entire career, every doctor, when if doctors hear about Grand Rounds, they're like, man. Yeah. You created a company for what I do for everyone that knows me on the planet. So every doctor gets called about their cousin, like, I, you know, my cousin, like, I get so called, oh, wow, oh, oh. it's like, oh, you're in Atlanta, what's going on? Oh, my husband, you know, my, my wife got breast cancer. This new doctor you see in Atlanta, Georgia. Less than two or three hours, I can figure out who would be a, a good person, both by looking online, by talking to people, and things like that. So there's a, there's a process with which we go through. So we basically took what was in my brain, uh, I should say we, I should say, to take a science team, and we built an algorithm and then tested it across a bunch of different outcomes. And so we now have over 7 billion pieces of data on all the practicing doctors in the country. That number of data increases every single day because we get more patients, we get more claims data to find out, you know, what, what's obviously what special they are in, where did they train, when did they train? Uh, what types of cases are they doing? Uh, do patients come back to them? All sorts of stuff so that we're able to predictably predict. And we validated this in, uh, a multitude of times with like rheumatologists in New Mexico, cardiologists. So, you know, cardiologists, they're a, a fun group. And uh, so we took, our, we took our, our predictive algorithm and then we said, okay, how how readily are cardiologists that are adopting new therapies or technologies? So, for example, new blood thinners center for atrial fibrillation. There's a new drug out, which is a lot safer than Coumadin. So we were able to look at what doctors were prescribing. And if you look at our top decile of excellent cardiologists, their rate of prescribing is 7x higher with these new drugs than the lowest decile. So, and we've seen this with the use of GCSF for oncology patients. We've seen it with uh, readmission rates for orthopedic surgery. We, we tested, and it seems that we are, we're definitely directionally correct. The bigger question is, you know, how good is good enough? You know, we, you know, we want to send everyone to 95 and 96 and 97, but if you live in Modesto and the best is, uh, you know, an 82, then maybe to the right person to send it. If, a lot of it actually then gets on, put on the clip. The doctors that look the great round. Okay, it's a gallbladder removal. Not a problem. Gallbladder's been taken out by great people. Not as good as this man. But we can't get them in a car 
more meaning in your medical ventures or your business ventures? Awesome, great question. So the question is, have I found more meaning in my medical ventures or in my business ventures? I am all about my, where I get the greatest um, satisfaction is how can I impact the most amount of people on this planet in the limited time that I'm on this planet. And that's why I went into academic medicine, and that's actually the real reason why I stay, stay in it also, is that I have, I believe I've just been very lucky with the family I was raised, the education that I got, that I need to really look to figuring out how I can make the biggest impact globally. So, um, Grand Rounds is definitely, right now, probably is definitely the biggest impact thing I've done, uh, but I have other things on the, I have a device that does the full metal jacket, right, that's, you know, sold in 70 countries or 50 countries across the world. Um, I'm currently the, the global PI on a, a stent to be placed in veins. There's no FDA-approved stents to be used in veins. We, we've been doing it for 25 years with just these stents that are in arteries that were built for arteries. So that, like, on the PI once that gets released and approved, the impact that that will have on patients. I have impact on all the people I trained across my career uh, that they'll go out and take care of more patients. Um, and so I really get excited about both, and that's why I do both. That's a good question. No one's ever asked me that one. So what's been my biggest failure or biggest mistake with going around? Um, I've been asked this before, but it's always a struggle because we've been really fortunate not to make really any major missteps, which is unlike most of my career. I usually step in it like, oh, uh, geez, let me get, get, it out, get out of this and I'll clean off my shoe. Um, the, you know, I really need to spend more time reflecting on that. I, I, I've been so fortunate with the people that I've worked with that 
when we run in, when we, we come up against something, we've been able to navigate it based on what we've been built. But, but I can tell you one, the one, one thing that we did was that the software that we built that the doctors used to, you know, um, it's uh, the doctors that were across the country were like, this stuff is awesome, it's better than Epic, it's better than anything I've used, can I use this at my home institution? And so if you Google pediatric second opinion, up will come the first thing, it'll say Boston Children's Hospital, get an expert opinion. So when you click on that, the whole thing says powered by Grand Rapids. But it's, you know, this is a direct consumer model where the patient pays with their credit card and all the software interactions, all the record gathering and everything is done by Grand Rounds, but it's always the Boston Builders expert because they went to the Boston Builders website. So that, um, that's been a very, you know, if that's up and running at DCSF, it's at MPH, um, it's a, a, a handful of other places. The, the thing that's been the biggest challenge is it's really expensive to do what we do in terms of getting medical records and similar unit, putting a summary that's written by uh, a physician or sometimes an MP or PA, and, and trying to convince an institution of how much that costs, because the institutions are just so dumb. They're like, no, we're, what we're going to do is much better. We're going to build a multi-million dollar building and we're going to staff it with like hundreds of people, and we're going to have to make patients come down here, and our doctors and our nurses have to interact with them to find out whether we can help them. Like that should all be done, like with technology. And then if yes, we can help you, like the woman that lives in Australia, then you come down instead of wasting. It. So if they actually looked at their opportunity costs and everything, they would realize that. So that's where we've been struggling is on the pricing of that product because of how expensive it is to do the services. Yes? We have one question from the Philippines. Oh, have, awesome. Um, yes. There's someone in the Philippines. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, was it easier starting a health company being a doctor? Was it, so the question is, was it easier uh, starting a health company being a doctor? Yeah, so people, great question. Uh, people always, um, yeah, so yes, number one. I came in with two pieces of paper, but I actually wasn't raising money. I was trying to find a CEO that could help me go raise money. And the guy that I was talking to was venture capital he said, This is such a great idea. I want to do it. And I want, you know, money we're just going to structure because you're not going to be the CEO. And you know, it's been great. But the thing was, is, you know, I was in my early, I was in my early 40s. I was an associate professor at Stanford. I've been at Johns Hopkins before. I was the chief of IR, right? So I had all of this, you know, I've written 80 publications or whatever. So I had this just tremendous deep domain expertise and knowledge that was externally validated. It wasn't me saying, like, I'm an awesome coder, like, or I'm innovative. Like, they could see that I actually have this domain expertise. So I think that that really allowed me to be able to start this company and not Whale trying to raise money uh, for it. So it isn't really, I mean, what I would tell you, and this is, I give this lecture at Health Plus Plus, is if, if you, the reason Grand Rounds has been so successful is because of the partnership I have as a practicing physician in a complex environment with my co founder, Owen Tripp, who's a tech entrepreneur businessman. And that, that partnership is what made us blow everyone else out of the water. All these other places that are trying to do health stuff, they don't have doctors involved, they don't have patients involved. They're, they're in their own little orbit, and then they try to go do something, and they make so many mistakes. If you are going to start a healthcare company, you have to have a provider, depending on if it's be a doctor or a nurse, but it's gotta be someone that understands how complex it is. So like, my breakfast meeting this morning, was with the guy that built and scaled Google Translate, right? It's used a billion times a day. He's been in the healthcare world for four years, and he's like, man, it's really complex. I can't believe that. I don't know whether I should stay in there. This guy that built Google Translate. My meeting two years ago was with the guy that ran Google Search for seven years. 
came out, he was going to solve health care. After a year, he was so despondent about how hard it was to get the data and important data that he quit. So these are people that built Google, like the flagship products that we talk about and use every day, and they can't figure out how to navigate health care. They leave it. They don't have a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist partner with them to help them. Cool. All right. Nice talking to you guys.